I'm now going to invite Linda Ford to upload her slide pack while I introduce you to Linda. Linda Ford is the CEO of Enterprising Partnerships, which has been in Victoria for 30 years. And it's a business that works in a number of areas, but predominantly in migrant entrepreneurship, young people and disadvantaged communities. Linda's passion for serving multicultural communities has resulted in her being awarded the Order of Australia Medal in last year's Queen Birthday, Queen's Birthday Honours List. She is an entrepreneur in her own right, and she is also an intercultural cities expert. Linda is going to share with us today the story of one of her entrepreneurship education programs. There are several under enterprising partnerships. And I hope her ideas for moving forward with entrepreneurship education outside of the traditional or, or the, um, the well understood space of tertiary education. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, Rosemary. You should be able to see my screen now. Yep, yeah, great, okay. Can I uh, also, before we start, acknowledge the traditional owners of the uh, Boon Wurrung and Woiwurrung country. Um, we acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as the traditional custodians of the Melbourne region, and we pay our respects to their uh, elders past, present and emerging. We also believe that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first original practitioners of innovation and business in this nation. Uh, and probably also in the world, and that we have a great deal to learn from their past practices and from their future leaders um, and their way of looking at uh, the society in which we live. So I wanted to start today um, just by letting you know that I'm coming at this purely from a practical perspective for the presentation. I don't have a background, an academic background in entrepreneurship. My academic background is quite different. Uh, it's actually in the area of social science and criminology. Uh, and so over the years, my experience has come from actually running uh, social, starting and running social enterprises, um, and also in the areas of community services, local and state government. So for me, entrepreneurship education is very much around uh, bringing all of those backgrounds together uh, to write new programs and uh, develop new activities and entrepreneurship opportunities for people who may not otherwise be able to access them. So we, I'll just try and turn this over. Whoops, sorry, hang on a second. All right. So our company helps people to grow and start, start and grow their business. And it's pretty much as simple as that. For us, those people could be in Melbourne, they could be in Shepparton, they might be in um, Medellin, in Colombia, they could be in Mexico City. For us, it's really about helping people to realise the dreams that they have for self-determination and the ability to start and grow their business. Enterprising Partnerships um, is, as Rosemary said, started in 1990, and it was started by Frank Wyatt, um, who is our uh, now our strategic director, as well as my husband. Um, and so 30 years ago, he became, uh, he had worked already in local and state government in South Australia, and decided to uh, get into his own business. And so 32 years of being uh, in business is no small feat these days, and especially in the area Area of management consulting, uh, which he was specialising in. So over the years, it was around running roundtables, providing advice to um, middle mid market companies, uh, as well as um, you know doing the strategic planning and those sorts of usual consulted kind of activities. About 15 years ago, we increased the focus on uh, into entrepreneurship education. So both of us had had the experience of working in entrepreneurship. Um, Frank had a, a large uh, experience, a lot of experience working in the area of entrepreneurship education in South Australia, particularly in the northern suburbs of Adelaide. So we decided that we would um, focus a lot more on entrepreneurship. And then in 2015, we realised that there were a whole lot of people that we weren't actually able to access because of very limited opportunities for yeah. funding for people who couldn't otherwise afford to become involved in, in this kind of a program. So we started iGen Foundation, which is a not-for-profit charitable organisation um, that has, uh, has now been around for six years. It has its own board and it uh, has its own programs. 
Last year, um, we all well, in 2020, uh, we began working internationally. And last year, we started the Global Centre for Entrepreneurship, which now operates in, um, in uh, Colombia, Mexico, Namibia, and Botswana. I'm going to be talking today about the four pillars um, and talk a little bit later on about uh, one of the things that we'll be doing later this year around advocacy. But one of the things that we have really understood over time is that there are these three um, traditional pathways of education, employment and training. And so education um, often fails people who are entrepreneurial because what we've found over the years through a lot of different uh, research is that successful entrepreneurs may have learning difficulties. And one of the reasons that they're so good at seeing um, a problem and working out a solution is because they watch people. They watch the way they operate. They can't just sit down and read a book and learn as uh, people without these learning difficulties may. And so as a result of that, um, there are many people for whom education will fail consistently. Employment, uh, there are also some people who are unlikely to get or maintain a job um, over the years. And so there could be people, uh, and again, I'm just being very general with all of this, but um, they could be people with mental health issues, for example. They may be people with um, a variety of uh, physical disabilities that would make them make it difficult for them to maintain employment uh, in a broader employment setting. Uh, and also, um, it's difficult for some people to be able to stay in or complete training. And sometimes that's due to the negative experiences that they've had about uh, being involved in education or employment. But it's often also um, about confidence. It's about um, aspiration. It's a whole range of different elements. And so the one thing that we believe is missing and that we think we're filling the gap on is around entrepreneurship um, as a fourth pillar. So right now we've sort of got a three-legged table. We would like a four-legged table, a fourth pillar, which talks about entrepreneurship as a legitimate life outcome. So we know for young people, for example, that unless they're offered uh, the ability, um, you know, essentially, as Alex was saying before, unless this world of entrepreneurship is exposed to people, um, people may not actually have a sense that this could be for them in terms of it being something that they can go to. So for us, post-school options or um, post-settlement for migrants, for example, really need to include entrepreneurship so that people are not just being pushed into these three traditional pathways, which for many of whom will not have um, not have outcomes. And it, entrepreneurship is not the panacea, but for some people it may end up being a much better option than their traditional education, employment and training pathways. So all of these lead, uh, lead into the kind of programs that we run. And we started off a few years ago really with just one program or a couple of programs around incubators, you know, really long 10 month incubator, for example, and some of the smaller um, three hour master classes, that sort of thing. And as we've moved over the years, we've actually realized um, how many other things people need in order to have entry, point, entry points into entrepreneurship. So just recently, I ran a one and a half hour online big ideas workshop for a number of young people who were disadvantaged. It was during uh, our lockdown here in Melbourne. And so uh, I organized this one point hour, hour long session um, for to get their big idea about a business onto onto paper and then realized having spoken with their um with the people that were working with them they actually probably need to turn that into two 40 minute sessions rather than an hour and a half all in one block so we're so we i then rewrote it so that we could do content here content there with a break and a bit of a workshop and so it's really about playing with this kind of educational process um, depending on what it is that people need. So I think because of our community services background, um, it is very much about looking at who's there, what do they need, and then configuring the process around them. So we offer everything now from a one and a half hour big ideas workshop um, for, well, for young people so far, but all of these others are available to everybody in communities. So they could be disadvantaged communities, they could be um, regional communities, they might be uh, just a you know, local area, it could be Melbourne CBD. Um, and it could also be uh, what we're wanting to do over time is to have a look at a range of different uh, groups of people we can be working with. 
So I just want to talk about some of the young people that we've worked with, and then I'll get quickly into the migrants that we've worked with as well. But um, this group at the top here, if you can see, uh, just let me see. So in the top right hand corner um, is a young guy by the name of Richard. He now is working in London as a tailor in uh, one of the very exclusive uh, tailoring companies in, in London. Um, he started uh, just wanting to make clothes and came in, but he didn't actually know what to do. He um, was a, essentially an apprentice, although not a formal apprenticeship to an Italian um, continental tailor, uh, but didn't know how to turn that into a business. And so um, we worked with him through our incubator program for 10 months and, uh, and he um, has now been able to use that problem solving approach. He hasn't started his own business, but his problem solving approach is now uh, used in order to get into this um, job over in, in the UK, which is fantastic. Um, you might see standing next to him, Rosemary, I'm not sure if you know Ben Flavel, who is uh, an MEI graduate from a few years ago. I'll talk about some of them as we go through. Um, we happen to uh, to get the best MEI students that uh, end up postgraduate, no, not postgraduate, graduated students um, who are uh, able to work with us. So if you have a look also from the second uh, person down from Richard is a young guy called Harry. And I'll talk about him a little bit more too, because this was 2016. And at that moment in time, Harry was um, essentially homeless, couch surfing, uh, wasn't 100% sure of what he would do. And I'm telling you this because that's what he told Forbes uh, magazine quite recently recently last year um, and he's got an amazing story. So in the very front row, the girl in the middle, um, Agum, is now a uh, is now a fashion designer. Uh, we've also got Costa on the right hand side in the blue shirt. Uh, we'll be talking about him a little bit more as an entrepreneur. Um, and we've got I mean I'm just looking around all of these young people. We've got uh, Aaron who's there, who's now working for um, Coinjar, which uh, which is a, a startup in Melbourne around cryptocurrency. Um, so we've got you know young people who've gone into a whole range of different areas. On the bottom uh, is a photo of our Young Entrepreneurs Pilot Program over in South Australia in 2018, I think. Um, and again, his, uh, his Frank and also Ben from MEI, um, from, uh, yeah, from the MEI, um, who is running that program. There were quite a number of other young people involved, uh, but they had um, football, etc. on that day and couldn't get, um, couldn't come to the final graduation that afternoon. So again, here's some more young people that we've worked with in the top row. Um, the other thing that you'll see is that some of the young people that we work with appear later as uh, what we call our support crew. So they're young people who have been through our programs who then have come in to help us out with more programs into the future. So again, if you're looking on the right hand side, Harry's in the front row. So we'll just keep an eye on Harry for a little while. Um, we do talk and chalk stuff. Uh, obviously, but we also um, do a lot of workshop uh, kind of programs and we do this very much based around the business model canvas because we want young people to have the tools and frameworks that they're going to need once they leave us. So business model canvas is, is not the be all and end all, but from a tool and a resource perspective, it's one of the best because what we say to young people is that you can leave here <clears throat> and any idea you have from this point forward you can run it as a first pass through this canvas just to get a sense of whether or not it's actually worthwhile you putting in any more time or effort or money into, into what it is that you might want to do next. <clears throat> I talked before about CoinSpot and uh, and um, Aaron McDonald, who's gone to work for CoinSpot. On the bottom left hand side here, um, right in the middle is a guy called Asher Tan. And one of the things that we have always done for every one of our programs is that we always invite entrepreneurs who are fairly close in age or settlement, for example, to young people or to, to people that we're working with. We want to give young people the ability um, to see that the journey is long and hard work uh, but we also want them to see that it's not that far away and the hard work will actually get them somewhere if they choose to keep going so asha tan um, is the ceo and founder of coinjar that um, startup I was talking about a minute ago in cryptocurrency. Uh, and he came in as a speaker and not only did those young people create networks, um, he knows who they are, and Aaron was able to use that network to get work, but also um, they were able to hear and understand his journey. And we do that all the time. 
Interestingly for me, if you look at that bottom picture on the left-hand side is a guy by the name of Hayden Brass. Hayden, uh, we just had in about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, no, last year, end of last year, to one of our entrepreneurship programs in December. For him to come in and talk with young uh, entrepreneurs about his company that he took over from his dad once when his dad passed away uh which is a um uh it's a pain reliever ointment um company uh called zia relief and uh, and so for him to be able to talk to them he said look i was where you were um a few years ago and this is where i am now so in terms of the work we do with migrants um again you will see on the bottom picture here um Rosemary, you'll see Carlos on the very right hand side. Um, Carlos Renteria, who was a, an MEI graduate. Um, we also have on the top row on the left hand side is Celestine Amuako Boteng, who also is a, an MEI graduate. And the top photo, we have John Bulzari, who is also an MEI graduate. Um, so we believe in surrounding ourselves with people who are really, really smart and really, really good at what they do. And what they have allowed us to do over time is to increase the programs, but bring the kind of um, theoretical practice and knowledge rigor that we actually want within our programs. We don't want it to be some Mickey Mouse kind of everyone come in, have a lovely time running a workshop. We want it to be much more than that. So uh, the top one here is a group at Dandenong, another at the bottom is our group out at um, Werribee, and then at the top is a group at, at, um, at uh, oh, sorry, Shepparton. Just really quickly want to tell this story. So the woman in the middle on the right hand side, her name is Hanan, and she, um, we found her essentially uh, in our Shepparton workshop. So what happened for us in, in Shepparton was that there is an organisation there that works with migrants that were really, I won't say who they are, but they're completely unhelpful and did not result in any kind of referrals for us whatsoever. And so I saw the woman, uh, about three, three women across um, with the blue and red hijab, I saw her at this organisation and I said, are there any people in your community who would like to start their own business? And she said, yes, actually, there's a lot of people. So she then got the sign up. Uh, we'd had 17 people by the Tuesday, we had 62 people by Friday, many of them Malaysians, many of them from the Malaysian Association of Goulburn Valley. Now that was interesting in itself uh, because we use an intercultural approach as I was talking, uh, Rosemary alluded to before. So interculturalism is about at every opportunity, having uh, taking the opportunity uh, to bring together people from different cultural language and faith backgrounds so that they get to meet each other, learn from each other, become friends, maybe become suppliers to each other, because what we want at the end of it is a, a much more uh, cohesive um, and, uh, and non-fragmented society. So all of our programs also have this intercultural overlay. Back to the story. So the uh, so Hanan got up to pitch and uh, she said to me, do you mind if I don't pitch on the, the cakes that I've been talking about all weekend? Can I pitch about my other business? And I said, that's, that's fine. So she stood up and started to talk about her business called My Kangaroo. And My Kangaroo is, a, um, is a, an export business, essentially, where she goes to all of these shops, Big W, Target, specialty stores, boutiques in Shepparton, and buys all of the clothes that are there and then sends them to Malaysia. She has six distributors in Malaysia uh, that she works through. And at the point when we met her, she was spending about $20,000 a month and sending back eight cubic metres of, uh, of, of um, clothing back to Malaysia. When she started giving her pitch uh, on the bottom left-hand side, I leaned across to the uh, mayor in, in the blue and I said to her, did you know Hanan? And she said, I've never heard of her before. And she said, do you know, though, she would be spending more money every month than a whole lot of other well-known business owners in Shepparton. And she said, and I feel like I should have known her, but I'm only just meeting her for the first time. Hanan has since grown a business. It's now sort of more than 20 cubic metres, more than $40,000 uh, $40, a month, sorry. Um, so she'll just keep building that business. But what that said to me is that she um, had she would have just been hidden all of that time. Um, the Council of Shepparton, Greater Shepparton Region, would not have been um, aware of her and therefore of her contribution. But since then, she also now sits on the um, the 
ministerial, multicultural ministerial business roundtable with the Victorian government. Uh, she, the other thing that we always do, and you'll see over on the right hand side, um, is Abby from uh, La Trobe Uni. So we always have somebody from a, an accelerator or an incubator program also on that pitch panel. Uh, and so Abby was able to take her into the Latrobe Accelerator program and she completed that. So a whole lot of opportunities were created as a result of one event which happened over one weekend, which now means that that woman um, by the name of Hanan with her husband and two of her six children uh, is actually able to grow her business in a regional area. So that's how important to us uh, entrepreneurship education is. So again, um, I know that I'll have to finish in a minute, but one of the things that we do is to try to make sure that people get the experience, as I said before, an intercultural experience, but particularly for migrants, we want to make sure that they can, um, that they are aware of really basic platforms like Wix, for example, where they can just have a, a, a an interim or a set up web page. They know how to, how to get into Wix and set up a home page so that they at least have some kind of a digital presence. Right, um, I won't go into these stories, but I was talking before about Harry. So Harry is in the second row, second from the left. And since then, uh, Harry now has uh, just recently won the award for the best largest SEO company in the world. Not Australia, not Melbourne, but in the world by SEMrush. Um, he has a, an office in London. He's got an office here in Paran that um, I think has about 28, 29 staff. And he also will be opening his business in his, his, an office in uh, New York over this year, later this year. Um, we've got Prenny we talked about before, who's now running his dad's company in uh, Botswana. On the right-hand side in the middle um, is, uh, is um, oh, sorry, I've just lost his name, is running uh, Yarra Valley, um, Simon Cox is running Yarra Valley Linen. He started that with his dad. We've got Dimitri on the bottom right-hand corner who runs LearnMate. He came into us in 2014 with a very different idea. But LearnMate um, now has 2,500 tutors um, tutoring young people in VCE. And then this is our team. So our team is intentionally incredibly diverse. It's in, it diverse in terms of age, gender, um, sexuality, um, culture, language, faith, you name it. And we've done that on purpose. Where possible and where everything is equal, we will take somebody into our team that we don't already have. So for example, we will take in, if somebody has the same qualifications, same experience, um, same lots of other things, but they were born overseas, we will take them into the business. Uh, if they have the same very much, except maybe for experience, we'll probably take the younger person. Part of it is about giving people a start in life and their experience and, and work life. But also it's about how can we possibly serve people as we do, uh, unless we have people from all around the world who are helping us. Um, how can we work with young people if we don't have young people? How can we work with migrants if we don't have migrants? Um, for us, it's a very, very important element of the work we do. And we've worked here with some of these people for 10 or more years now, and we always will. Uh, and they're fantastic people. In the bottom right hand corner, you'll see um, Andres Alvarez, who is in Colombia. So he's um, running in Medellin, the, uh, the little outpost um, of the Office of Enterprising Partnerships in Medellin. Um, and then then we're just to the left there is Carlos. Um, he is over in, uh, in Mexico. And um, we've got Prenny who is uh, working in Botswana and uh, uh, another woman who I don't have on here who's in Namibia. So in terms of our future, what are we going to be doing? We really want to increase access for people. We really want to be working with offenders because we know that many offenders are actually very entrepreneurial. The only thing that um, gets them into big trouble is that what they're usually entrepreneurial in, in is actually illegal, but we know that they've got the basics there. So um, one of my backgrounds is working with young offenders. So I'm really keen to do something like that. We also really want to work with people with disability and, uh, and we've been having conversations around that. 
um, because there are so many things that people can do that they're just not being valued for. So that's an area of interest for us. Long-term unemployed people who may be long-term unemployed for all of those reasons, education, employment and training I talked about before. And with um, Swinburne and with Rosemary and a, another um, academic at Swinburne by the name of Dr. Glenda Valentine, we'll be running a program for families uh, funded by the City of Melbourne and they will be, uh, Glenda and uh, Rosemary will actually be evaluating that for us. The next thing we want to do is around advocacy. Um, so we don't want edu uh, education, entrepreneur, education, employment and training to be the only three pillars. We want to get those over the line. And one of the reasons uh, is also because it slips through the gaps. So one of the issues that we have is if we say to the Department of Employment, um, we should be running a program for unemployed young people, they'll say, well, you know, that's young people, you need to go to this department. So we go to that department and say, we should be running business programs, entrepreneurship programs for young people. Oh, well, that's not really young people, that's business. So we quite literally often feel like ping pong uh, about pinball, uh, running around on a pinball machine because it doesn't fit anywhere. We'll also be growing our business um, and our coaching and roundtables focusing on mid-market uh, businesses and then growing the Centre for Global Entrepreneurship and expanding further into LATAM, Africa and uh, Thailand, which will happen at the end of this year. So that's it for me. Um, any questions? Thanks, Rosemary. Thank you, Linda. That was wonderful and interesting and inspiring. But, uh, if, what, can I open the floor? And exhausting. <laughs> uh, um, Alex, you got your hand up? Yeah, oh, Linda, thank you. That was lovely. Um, how, how, how do you get your international participants are they people that were local here and uh, do you mean in shepparton for example or those sorts uh, of no 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 you're like you're talking about the botswana ones the yeah ones and all so one of the unintended and very pleasant consequences of having a very culturally diverse um uh group of staff or team members is when they go home <laughs> and so uh. they've all been trained in our methodologies uh and so one of the as I said, very pleasant unintended outcomes is that they're actually taking now the big ideas days and startup weekends and the incubators and accelerators to their countries of origin. And um, for us, as soon as we can start getting out into the world again, that's what we'll be doing. They know what they're doing. They're going to be running it. They're, they're doing all of that aspect of it. And um, for us, that's a really important component. It then has a local flavor it has it's a culturally appropriate flavor um because while they know the methodologies while, while they've learned from us the methodologies they know the way that it should actually be executed cool thanks thank you leonor did you want to ask something did i see your hand yes please um linda when you talked about incubator your incubator programs i was curious to understand what that looks like uh, depends on what the program is actually. So right now we're running a six month incubator uh, in Ballarat. We're just recruiting for that at the moment. And that's around export. So that's a six month, um, uh, uh, it's workshop days as well as um, business coaching, as well as webinars and other kinds of activities um, that focuses on getting businesses uh, export ready. So, um, Another one that we have, for example, our, um, our getting down to business program that's finished now, but the one I was talking about before with Harry, et cetera, um, that was a 10 month incubator program. And so we'd actually split that group up into three different cohorts. So there was the cohort for early stages, people who really just had a business idea and had done nothing with that. Then we had a startup group and then we had our scale group. So they were all in early stages of business uh, or have had an idea all the way through the scale group, which maybe had a business but a few customers and didn't really know what to do next. So um, that also had business coaching, it had roundtables, it had webinars, it had um, a whole range of different elements to it, uh, bringing in entrepreneurs, as I said before, um, export program in Ballarat. We also bring in local Ballarat 
um, uh, entrepreneurs who are involved in export who can talk about their positive and negative uh, experiences of entrepreneurship, oh, sorry, of export, for example. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what the program is. And that's the same, whether it's an accelerator or anything else. There's a there's kind of some commonalities, which is around business coaching and the workshops, but different um, programs will have different activities as part of that. How does it differ from, a, from your accelerator programs then? Is it really just about focus or, or is there another difference? Yeah, it's more about the length of uh, the, um, the length, the, the number of um, years uh, or the, the stage of the business, I suppose. So when we recruit, we're looking for a certain type of business when uh, we're looking for an, a program, an incubator program. When we're looking for an accelerator program to recruit for that, we're looking for very specific types of businesses to go into that. So accelerators are more likely, well, they are um, further down the track. Uh, they're people who are wanting to accelerate the growth of their business. So they don't, they're not people with a business idea. They're much further down the track to that. Great, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, everyone. We've come to the end of our time slot. Linda, we could listen to you for a long time. The whole story of what you and Frank have done is just fascinating and important and interesting. And it's just a privilege to be connected in some way to what you guys do at the grassroots. Thank you. Um, yeah, no, it's a pleasure. And Alex, it's it's always inspiring to uh, listen to uh, and exhausting as well, see the amount of research you do, <laughs> but to see what you do and, and how you inform what we're doing. So thank you both for coming. It was terrific. I hope everybody can come back at four o'clock to listen to our closing panel, which has Emeritus Professor Murray Gillen, who I like to say was the founding father of entrepreneurship education in Australia, and indeed did it here at Swinburne. He will be hosting a panel discussion with um, Professor Rowena Barrett from up at QUT in Queensland and Martin Blimmel from the University of Technology on entrepreneurship education ecosystems and the continued development of entrepreneurship education, which we've heard quite a bit about here in this session. So I hope you'll join me and thank you again, Alex and Linda, for your time. Great. Thank you, Rosemary. Bye. See you, yes, everyone. Nice. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Linda. Uh, it's just amazing <laughs> what you guys have done. Thank you. Just Thank amazing. you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And when you said that, I was like, oh, I've got no idea what I'm going to say. But then the more I sort of got into it, the more I thought, oh, there is a bit of a story here. So, yeah, um, so yeah thank you for that. Yeah. And, thank you know, you. I, as you know, I particularly like that angle that you've got on the fourth pillar. And it's a shame that we didn't have the opportunity to discuss it. But, you know, you might have poked a, you know, planted I a hope. seed there. Yeah, I certainly hope. Yeah. And I thank think it's you. a case of watch that space. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And we will be calling on lots of academics to uh, march on Parliament with us around all of that. <laughs> I reckon they'll come. I reckon between yeah. you and Alex Maritz, there's a huge story yeah. there and yours yeah. is such an important grounds film. Anyway, I'm thank you. Go Take care. And yeah, thank you. And uh, good luck for the rest of the afternoon. I'll see if I can come along at four. I'll see hope you. you can. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.